Alright, Casey was off the farm yesterday, so I was here by myself and I got a few things done. Um, I started cropping out some of the peppers that are already dead. I pruned our late succession of tomatoes and it was going to be 42 degrees last night, so I got the um, frost cloth ready so that we could put that up so we didn't get any damage on that and we didn't. I also reseeded some beets in this bed that had gotten eaten by caterpillars. Um, Pretty much like the whole back half of the bed got eaten, so I reseeded that. And then I got the rest of the drip irrigation put up in this tunnel and took out the wobblers because we're going to need the wobblers for plot 8. And then this is tunnel 7, so I also put the drip irrigation in this and took out the wobblers to put that in plot 8. So we'll have two sets of wobblers for plot 8 that should be pretty much ready to go. I also kept everything watered and just kind of did like some general prep or like cleanup of hoops and insect nets and then just kind of walked around and started planning where we're gonna put um, next successions of things. That's kind of one of a regular thing that Casey and I do is we just walk around the farm and we you know see how everything is doing and plan next successions. So all the old buckwheat cover crop here set seed and it started growing uh, so we pulled the tarps off to plant it and this is what we got. No big deal though. Nothing a little fire can't fix. That was lit. What you got going on over here, George? Oh. Yep, yep. Irrigation station three. I just had it on the ground, so that's better. Could use some string. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we had over here. I didn't want to make a second trip. <laughs> yeah. Heard that. Didn't have it in my fanny pack. So oh, that. what? Fail. So these two timers would be enough for plot six, seven, and uh, back there in eight. Okay, I've been horrendous at uh, recording stuff, and by horrendous I mean nothing. Emma was here yesterday, and we did a bunch of planting, um, bed flipping, filling in holes like on the collards. We got the irrigation stations ready. We got all the new plot planted. There's spinach, carrot salad, and some other greens in there. Filled in some of the holes in here from the caterpillar damage. We got a lot done yesterday, and uh, we actually have a life, so we had to do stuff for that too. <laughs> so. Uh, but anyways, yeah, today's harvest day and it's raining. So this, of course, it always rains on harvest day. Yeah, this rain is from um, leftovers from Tropical Storm Beta. And we're supposed to get like two, two and a half inches between today and tomorrow. That's gonna be perfect for the carrots and all that to germinate. And we got other things seeded, other things planted. It's gonna be really good for it to get established and going. This should be a good harvest. It's kind of a hard time to have things going with the pest pressure and fungal pressure.
Uh, so something super cool this week, um, JM, so the guy that wrote the Market Gardener. He has a master class and we've been in it since uh, it was available to be in it. You know, back when we lived in the camper, it's like the first thing we did. Him and his team have allowed me to show you guys some of the course so you guys can get a feel for what it's like. And I've had some emails asking if it's worth it. I think it is, you know, like the amount of money you'll save and not having to fail and stuff. It's helped us a lot with um, efficiencies, which is the big thing, because if you figure how many miles you walk on one acre, it's kind of ridiculous and you want it to be as efficient so you don't spend as much time because it is labor intensive. Uh, the crop knowledge is really cool too. So instead of, instead of wandering around on videos like ours, it's very direct. It's just solid growing info for pretty much all the crops and they're always adding on new things. And yeah, so I'm gonna show the tomato and radish part just a little bit and show you guys around the course. And I'm not getting an affiliate or anything like that, so don't think I'm trying to sell you this. I, I asked if I could show this to you guys, so. Um, so yeah, <laughs> a little different there, and most people would only do it if they get something out of it. Uh, so I hope you guys think it's cool and um, uh, consider investing in it, you know. We, we invest about $1,000 each in education a year you know, you can buy a tool for the same price as something that's educational and not use the tool. But if you learn new things, it will likely help you out somewhere along the line. Okay, so this is the course when you log in and these are all the lessons over here. So uh, crop planning, um, especially if you're a CSA farm or want to be a CSA farm, that's really important. Not much of a crop plan for us with the pandemic stuff, but uh, the tool shed, so that's all the tools. Uh, there's also a lot of discounts on tools, like enough discounts on tools to pay for the class. Uh, the nursery, how they start seeds and everything. Irrigation, actually that's new, we haven't watched any of that. Cover crops, um, that's a talk JM does with living soils. Season extension, uh, you, I mean, you can see it all here. So it's a lifelong course, so they keep adding stuff. And JM manages a funded um, experimental farm and they do a lot of cool stuff so there's always great information radishes there's a lot of good reasons radishes French breakfast we're using the six row seeder to seed it and we're using hole number C and the adjustment is the pulley between being in the middle of each of the uh, gears and the uh, brackets are not too tight. I want to make sure I'm putting the same amount of seed inside each of the hoppers. And so when I'm going down, if there's one hopper that is spreading too much or not enough, I'll quickly realize it doing it that, that way. The other thing that's really important is we, we want to be measuring how much seeds that we're dropping. So I'm measuring the jar first, writing it down, in 30 gram. My objective is to have more or less 85 gram per 100 foot beds. Okay, so that's done. And now we're good to go. So going down my bed, I'll want to put my inner, the pulley inside of the bed, and I'm eyeballing the right marker, making sure that we're always right on the edge of the 30 inch bed. As I come back forward, I'm eyeballing the same edge, but in lining it with the, the mark that was done moving down the first time so that we're really well centered. You want to go with a steady pace, not too fast, not too slow. And uh, also looking at your hoppers, making sure that everything is, is, is good spend any time cultivating them and plus because we're seeding them with the six row seeder you know there's not a lot of space the only tool that i have that does make an impact on the weed is this flex tine weeder that we use a lot on the farm it's uh, it was developed by two bad cats and it's really awesome and so it's a 30 inch flex tine weeder and you'll just do one pass going down and uh, it's gonna destroy most of the weeds that are perking up, popping up, 
by lightly disturbing the soil. When using this tool, you need to make sure that it's a bright sunny day and that the soil is not wet at all, it needs to be dry. And so, so the Flextine Weeder is a pretty awesome tool because it allows you to cultivate the soil really fast. It might not get rid of all the weeds, but you know, let's say you do 50%, uh, that's, that's certainly good enough. It also breaks the crust, uh, which is really important. It allows air into the soil, it activates the fertility. So overall... Breaking the crust is really important. Overall, it's a pretty useful tool. Yeah, so, you know, you got chard, zucchini, peas, spinach, melons, lettuce, leeks, kale, all this stuff is, they're all videos like that with all the information you need. The carrot one's really good. Um, there's also this extra stuff. So the book comes with the course. Um, this is actually a TV show that they did. Um, so there's spring, it's actually really cool. But, uh, let's see. Um, still have to watch this one. Uh, building a bubbler, like the way we wash the vegetables. So that's in there. And the webinars. I mean, actually they add a lot. We haven't watched a lot of them. It's so like none of the leaks uh, because it's been summer. So, but yeah, that's a, uh, that's the course and then there's also a Facebook group and there's a discussion thing somewhere around here with yeah with quite where people bring in questions and stuff but it's been well worth the money it's paid for itself extremely fast so here's one of the videos this Feel is tomatoes yeah tomatoes So the plant will have a lot of room to establish. We will front load the fertility so we won't need to be coming back and forth with that. And we will basket weave the plants every week to make sure that they grow straight. Besides that, it's all about monitoring the progress and in the end harvesting beautiful field tomatoes that you bring to market and that you make a lot of money with. Starting tomatoes. Pretty simple, we start them in 72 cell trays. And the important thing is that once they're seeded, you need to place them at optimal temperature range. And this information is usually on the seed package, so either written in the back or in the catalog. But you'll, you'll learn that, let's say, tomatoes need to be germinated at, you know, 65 or 70 degrees Celsius, whatever. So you follow that guideline, and then we stagger them, give them more room, and leave them for another three, four weeks at optimal temperature, 80 degrees at night in the nursery. And that's pretty much it. The last step will be one week before they're ready to go into the fields. You'll want to put just a little bit of chicken manure just to give them a final boost when they're hardened off in the hardening off area before they go into the transplant. And time you know picking up the other thing is that you yeah, guys this video is 38 minutes long so there's a lot of info in it you need to absolutely make sure that both the plug and the ground is wet and that's really important for the rapid root uptake so before anything else uh, make sure that the ground is is wet and the plug is wet and that's when you're ready to transplant for bed prep so we did the usual, so the beds have been a bit raised, so they're a bit warm for a cold spring. And uh, broad fork, really important to broad fork the ground. The tomatoes are gonna go deep, so you need to make sure that your soil is loose and deep. We've added a lot of compost, almost two inch of compost on all, on all the bed. And I've used my not good compost or even manure because I won't have any issues with weed control because I'm putting landscape fabric and you know even manure or compost that is not top top uh, it's going to break down and it's going to provide food for the soil so I'm, I'm using not my best compost and don't get me wrong when I'm talking about 
good or, or not as good compost, I'm usually talking about if it has weeds, weed seeds in it, which is really hard to bring to that level. So, you know, usually I buy the compost that doesn't have any weed seeds and I make my own compost with a lot of the, the elements and the scraps that I have on the farm and the manure from the cows of this farm. And that's the compost that I use for the tomatoes, the field tomatoes, and I use a lot of it. I also, greenhouses, uh, they, they're not grafted, so you don't need to be careful of the graft point. And we actually want to bury them as high as we can, because all of these, you know, these white hair, these are all roots that are going to take from the plant. So when we have a plant like this, we want to bury it all the way to the first branch. So that's an extra two inch. So that means that we're putting the plants really deep into the holes. We need more space to maneuver, hence bigger holes. And also that's the reason why we use these trowels. Okay? So you're going to dig a hole, not too big. So take some of the soil out, and then we're going to put the pot into the hole. And it's really important that when we do so, the two things that are most important is that the bottom hits the ground. That's really important so that it presses. So I'm going to dig a hole and I'm going to put the, the plant to, to, my, to my left and I'm going to fill the right side and then I'm going to press it with the extra soil, making sure that it's buried, that it's deep and that it's firm into the ground. And then you'll have a tomato plant that is going to stick up and it's going to have about 12 to 14 inch sticking out of the ground, which is exactly what we want. So you have a long plant, a lot of it is in the ground. It's really well watered, the plug in the, uh, the soil, and it's going to kick right in. So that's what we want. So it is pretty straightforward. You want to be harvesting with both of your hands to be as efficient and fast as possible. Depending on the cultivar that you're growing, the ripeness will come at different times. Uh, colors is one indicator, but the softness is also another one. You obviously want to harvest them more on the right side because your clients will appreciate the fact that they have more fruits, more flavor to them. Um, I harvest using this simple cart. Um, I'll share the design of this uh, in the master class. It's pretty straightforward. And then harvesting crates that are shallower so that we have no more than two layers of tomatoes will you know, once this is done, I will simply stack them like that and then keep on going so you don't want to overfill them. You can't really go wrong with learning new things. So uh, we get a lot of emails about people asking questions about this or that. And the reality is uh, you can't learn enough and you just have to do it. So it's well worth the money this is kind of a no-brainer so we got light rain and um it's ideal for this no it's not paraphernalia <laughs> this is um this is nematophagus fungi i think that's how you say it uh this little packet covers an acre which is about everything we have in production plus a little bit um so you just mix it in with a sprayer and spray it out on everything and what it does is it will help control root rot nematodes. So like the little knobs you get on carrots. Um, my friend Nick sent this to me, um, growing back to Eden. You guys may have seen his videos. He's living with Paul Gatchi right now and they know a guy who, who has like the uh, store where he sells this stuff. Um, I'll ask Nick and I'll link it. But yeah, so everything, now that we have light rain, I'm gonna go over all the bare soil um, exposed to the rain and Get this spread. Two inches of rain from Tropical Storm Beta. All right, Casey is taking Emma home. So while he's doing that, I'm gonna start working on cropping out the shishito peppers because they're pretty much done and we need to get something else in the high tunnel before it gets too cold. So um, I'm gonna show you guys how we do it. We use loppers because they the pepper plants, since they're in so long, they start to get really woody. And you can go through with pruners, but it's really hard to um, do with pruners, it's, or at least for me, because I have small hands. Uh, I can't really like squeeze down on the pruners that well. So loppers work a lot easier. 
Um, you just come in at the base and chop it off. It's 5.30 in the morning on Saturday before the market and I've been putting it off all week to um, candle broody hen's eggs so I'm gonna do that now and so there's 10 under there and we'll see um, how they're looking. You can definitely see that one's doing well. There's a air pocket and then there's veins. That one's also doing well. You can actually see its beak. You can see its beak right there or part of it. There's another one with part of it moving in there too. All right, so they all look really good. So today we're uh, going to help Ben and Emma's family process their chickens. They have 80. Based on what I've read in the comments, uh, people seem to be pretty interested in it. And um, it's a pretty good skill to have, especially if you want to raise your own food. Also, I don't think anybody's going to freak out about killing chickens and all that. I always thought it was weird that it was more normal to go and get 6 or 12 wings at a restaurant, but it's then weird to kill chickens and raise your own food. Um, you know, you think 6 to 12 wings, that's 3 to 6 lives, chicken lives, for one order, so. Alright, we're just about done doing the chickens here and uh, I'm gonna go through the process so you guys can see it and uh, hopefully you learn something. This is where they get killed, so you cut their necks and they bleed out. And when they come into here, this is the scalder. The scalder is at 145 uh, degrees, 145, 150, and they're in there for not very long until the skin pulls off their feet. And then they come in the plucker here. So after it's plucked, they're plucking one now. Uh, it gets eviscerated, so you cut off part of the neck and stuff and take the guts out and take the legs off. And um, Tori's really good at it, so I'm gonna have her explain it. On the spot, oh, man. Tori. Hey, with one shot, she can go in, pull them all out, and the lungs. Oh, now the pressure's <laughs> really on. <laughs> all right. That one's done. And she'll be able to walk you through, you know, how it, how it goes. Yeah, so we take off the legs first. So Adri was working on that on the there. Legs, yeah. So what you do is you find the little joint right here. So you have both sides of the knee joint and you go right in the center of that. Okay. So right down the center and then it just splits open and then you don't want to cut into the bone because that's going to dull your knife. So then you just cut it off the rest of the way and then do the other one. So you can see the joint, both sides of the joint there, the tendon, and you just cut through that. And if you want to save your feet, you can. So next you come to the oil gland here. This little knob is the oil gland. It's what the chickens use to clean themselves and preen themselves. So it makes the meat bitter. So what we're gonna do is cut that off. So we just go down and then lift it up a little bit and over. So you can kind of see like the oil gland in there. It's like the yellowish looking thing. And there's a little bit left, so we'll cut that off. So that's fully cut off now. And that goes in the gut bucket. And then from here we get the crop out. So what we're gonna do is just lift the skin up by the breast here. Just cut through, make sure not to cut too much into it. So now you separate a, a little bit. So this is the neck and then this is the esophagus, this ribbed thing here. And then this kind of deflated looking balloon, that's the crop. So we wanna get all that separated and out. So what I do is I just kind of come beneath it and just shove my thumb through it to separate the membrane here from everything. And then I just pull it all apart so that all the neck skin, esophagus, and crop is all in my hand. Then I try and separate it some more. It's really slippery. So 
so you just kind of got to dig in to it. Yeah. So everything's separated now. And what I do is just cut that off. That goes in the gut bucket. And then we're going to cut the neck off. And we want to get it as close as we can um, below the shoulders so that when we shrink wrap bag it, it's not going to cut into the bag. So there's all that off. We can save the neck for um, stocks and broths if we want. So now we're going to eviscerate the rest of it. So to eviscerate, um, we're just going to come in the middle here and just take the skin. Again, we don't want to ever puncture into the chick, uh, like poke or puncture into the chicken. So we're just opening up this cavity here and then really ripping it apart so that we can get our hand in there. So you got all the guts. So now what I do is I just reach as far into it as I can and then use my fingers to scoop under to the rib cage. So I'll scoop under the right side to get the lungs out there and then I'll scoop under the rib cage on the left side to get the left lung. So you really just got to get back in there. Moment of truth. See if I can do it. <laughs> and then you just pull it all out. She oh, got I got em. both lungs. She got both lungs. Oh man. So the lungs would be back here along the rib cage. So we can see the ribs there. These little white things, I take those out. Those are testicles from a male chicken. And then we got the kidneys in the back. I normally, you can take those out. I just leave them in. Um, they just cook as part of the chicken. So now we have all the guts on the table. It's still attached. And now we need to cut off the vent um, where the poop comes out. So there's two little hip bones right here. We're gonna cut on the left side. Go straight down. And then we'll cut over and then we'll cut up or down, whichever way. So that completely separates all the guts from the chicken. There's still a little bit of the esophagus left in there, so I pull that out. Okay, there it goes. <laughs> all right. So that chicken, um, it still has a little bit of poop on it that came out from the intestines. Um, so we just rinse that off really well and then it goes into the ice bath. That's where we hand it off to Adri or whoever's here and they go over there and rinse it off. All right, so this is the intestines and then we have the gizzard here. And then the liver are these two dark brown. And then the lungs are the two kind of pinkish. And then the heart is the single one right here. So you can save the heart and just pull that off. You can save the lungs, just pull that off. And then the gizzard, you just kind of separate everything, pull that. And what you can do here is cut that off. So the gizzard is basically their stomach. So you just um, slice it lengthwise until you feel it kind of open there. And then you turn it inside out over the gut bucket and empty all the contents. And this is just like grass and seeds and all that. So then the stomach lining here, this yellow, you just peel it away from the gizzard. Just peel off as much as you can there. all that off and then you can keep that for the gut or the um, stocks as well and then lastly the liver I do the liver last so that I can use gravity to um, cut everything off because everything else 
um, just goes in the gut bucket and also you want to be really careful not to cut the bile sack because the bile is really bitter and it can spoil the meat so I just grab as much of the liver as I can and then I have the bile sack and everything else beneath it and I cut slightly into the liver and just let gravity take everything down into the gut bucket and then the liver you can also keep to eat and gizzards are Very good nice. yes. deep fry with hot sauce really? down in Florida <laughs> shout out to Crouch's restaurant <laughs> high school <laughs> yeah. so then they get sprayed off and washed and then put in the ice bath there they can stay there for a while and then um, this is a drying rack and that's used to just let the chicken dry before you bag it but if you guys want to check out more in detail of the process uh, Bruno's set up and everything and his chicken so check out their video it's gonna be way more in depth okay so we're back uh, not too bad it's just like probably like four hour deal total that's like 80 chickens so um, that should be plenty for their family for winter until next spring water in the nursery um, checking everything seeing what needs irrigated um, we got some new seeds out here that are germinating from the rain so we want to make sure that they're we want to make sure that those are good Saturday is always crazy when you have when we have the markets and we're coming back to check on things and like you spend a day away and you're like oh man you could like see growth and see that things change it's always wild I'm gonna take a pretty chill the rest of the day edit this video um, just keep up with some water things like that for the tree and accounting stuff uh, we're just gonna Use the evisceration uh, in place of that, but I'll show you guys, these are chestnuts here. They're Chinese chestnuts, actually. Um, but they have these spiky, ooh, hurts. They have these spiky balls on them. And uh, yeah, they'll, they'll eventually, they'll eventually split open and chestnuts will fall. Um, but I, I went over this tree before, but I just want to show you guys the fruit because it wasn't on there when I did it. 